IB Agents Osteobites webinar and podcast presents the latest in osteosarcoma treatment, research, innovation, and hope each week. Today, we're talking with Dr. Jane Yanagawa, Associate Professor of Thoracic Surgery at UCLA on osteosarcoma lung metastasis. Welcome to Osteobites, everybody. It is so sunny and warm today that uh, my snack is blueberries. <laughs> So I hope you have your snacks ready too. And thank you for being here on such a sunny day and you're here with us. Really, really glad about that. Um, today we're talking with Dr. Jane Yanagawa about osteosarcoma lung metastasis. Dr. Yanagawa is a thoracic surgeon at the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine Department of Surgery. She uh, completed her residency at UCSD and her fellowship in thoracic surgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She graduated from Baylor Medical School, which makes her a very happy person this week. Just guessing. Me too. <laughs> Even if you're not into sports, you're a happy person this week, right? I, yeah, trying to be happy in general. Actually, though, Baylor is separate from Baylor University, so... I actually, I don't know anything about sports, but I only know that because I went to Baylor College of Medicine, so it's sort of related. Yeah, I thought they were at least sort of related. Um, okay, in addition, our panel today includes Amy Woodcheck, physician's assistant and childhood cancer survivor, and MIB agents, junior board members, and Osteo Warriors, Mia Sandino and Charlotte Murdoff, and um, Victoria Marsh may make a star appearance, a uh, former junior board member. Hey, Victoria. <laughs> and I'm your host, Ann Graham, executive director of MIB Agents. MIB Agents is a pediatric osteosarcoma nonprofit dedicated to making it better for our community of patients, caregivers, doctors, and researchers with the goal of less toxic, more effective treatments and a cure for osteosarcoma. We make it better in three ways, through direct patient and family support, with many programs to ensure that no one walks alone through this disease, through education, including our annual factor conference, Osteobites, and our testing and research directory, and of course, our book, which is now available in Chinese and Spanish, Osteosarcoma from Our Families to Yours, and through research by funding it, sharing it, and supporting researchers and physicians. With that, Dr. Yanagawa, would you get us started by introducing yourself, please? Um, I think you did a great job. <laughs> I'm Jane Yanagawa. I'm a thoracic <laughs> surgeon. Um, I'm at UCLA, and um, I work very closely with everyone in our uh, UCLA Musculoskeletal Tumor Board, and we have now a UCLA Sarcoma Research Group, and, and they're like, these colleagues are like family to me, and um, so are our patients and their families, so it's really um, an honor to do this work and to be able to participate today. Hi, my name is Charlotte Murdoff. I'm 17 and a junior in high school. I was diagnosed with osteosarcoma in July of 2018. And I recently just finished another chemotherapy and I'm headed to Seattle next week for a CAR-T trial. Hi, I'm Mia Sandino. I am 22. I was diagnosed with osteosarcoma back in September of 2018. Um, and I am still going through treatment now with immunotherapy. Um, and all I can say is I'm very happy to be here today. I'm always happy on osteobites, but Dr. Yanagawa is incredible, and I've been in her office many a time, and it is an honor to have you here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amy Woodcheck. I'm a physician assistant in pediatric oncology and also a um, 37-year survivor of childhood cancer. And this is my warrior with me today. Beth. Hi, my name is Victoria. This is Victoria, and we're happy to be here at Osteobites today. Today, we'll be talking about multi, uh, pulmonary metastasectomy for osteosarcoma. Um, so where did this idea of doing lung resection for osteosarcoma pulmonary mets even come from? Um, in 1971, the thoracic surgeons at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center published their initial experience um, where they had just started treating 
osteosarcoma and pulmonary metastases with um, surgery, even if it meant repeated thoracotomies. And when they published this uh, study, they said that in comparison to the historical outcomes of patients who had osteosarcoma and pulmonary metastases, they had doubled the five-year um, survival outcomes by doing offering the surgery. Um, since then, and now it's crazy to think that was like 50 years ago, um, since then, there have been so many actually uh, uh, retrospective studies with very similar uh, results showing that patients who underwent surgery had better outcomes than patients who did not undergo surgery. But does this really prove that there is a benefit to having surgery in itself? Um, the problem with these kinds of studies that are retrospective is that they are essentially comparing apples to oranges potentially, because what people say is that if you look at a group of patients where maybe a surgeon said, hey, you're a great surgical candidate, let's offer you a surgery, versus patients who they said, oh, I can't offer you a surgery, that may already be sort of uh, predisposing for different outcomes in those groups. Um, and so ideally, when you wanna prove that an intervention has a specific outcome, you would have what is called a randomized controlled trial. A randomized controlled trial is where you select one group of patients that are very similar. So in this situation, it would be a, patient, a group of patients who could potentially have surgery and then randomize there to patients who did or did not have surgery to prove if the surgery itself had an impact on the outcome. Um, even though that kind of study is com considered the gold standard though, that has never been able to be performed for any uh, pulmonary metastasectomy for any cancer, actually. Um, sort of recently, someone put a huge effort in to try to do a randomized controlled trial for pulmonary metastasectomy with colon cancer metastases, actually, because that's far more common, and they thought that would be the easiest one to prove um, a benefit. And after six years, they had to close it because there was, there was they just could not uh, get any patients to enroll. And in the end, what was really uh, interesting about that, that study was that um, they, they realized that a lot of the patients were not being enrolled because the doctors themselves didn't feel comfortable enrolling them. Um, so, you know, without the randomized controlled trial, that makes it even more important to have as much data as possible that you can achieve uh, to figure out who is gonna have a good outcome from surgery and also makes it so important to have surgeries that um, are, are, are not morbid. What are some of the um, uh, factors that we uh, consider when we decide if someone is a candidate for surgery? Well, having a good outcome is, is, uh, is, is important. And this study, the International uh, Registry of Lung Metastases is the largest retrospective study. They looked at 5,206 patients. Um, these patients had pulmonary metastases of different kinds of cancers, including sarcoma. Um, and they found some very specific factors that uh, seem to be associated with better outcomes even after a surgery. So patients who had a complete resection, uh, meaning that uh, every lesion was removed and the lesions had negative margins. They also found that the disease-free interval, so the time when the patient had a primary tumor of the diagnosis and then um, the diagnosis of metastases was important. And also the number of metastases was important. Patients who had one uh, metastasis did better than ones who had two or three, who did better than patients who had four. Um, and all these things are sort of obvious, but it was good that they showed that sort of in their study. I thought one of the most important things that came out of uh, this report is that, um, here I marked it in red, that even with patients who had a resection of their metastases, um, the, the incidence of recurrence is very high. So specifically, if you look here at the category of sarcoma, 53% um, of the patients, so a little more than half actually had to undergo a second operation even. Um, the other important thing to know though, is that in the groups who required additional surgeries, they actually did just as well as the patients who had their initial uh, metastasectomy. So it wasn't that requiring a second operation meant that you were gonna have a worse outcome necessarily. 
So what have we learned in general? So when we meet a patient who has pulmonary metastases, the things that we consider, um, one is the primary tumor controlled. So since the previous data showed that you really have to have, um, offer a surgery that removes all of the disease for it to be beneficial, um, of course, the primary tumor has to be uh, uh, treated. Um, is there any extra thoracic disease? So sort of same concept, which is that if you're gonna offer a surgery, then that should be removing all of the disease. These are pretty much repeating the same thing over and over again. The, you know, the third, are the lesions completely resectable? And that's sort of from a technical standpoint, you know, do you think that your operation is gonna be able to give you negative margins and, and all of the tumor burden? And finally, you know, can the patient physiologically to tolerate an operation or the resection that would be required and what would be the impact on the quality of life? What is the role of surgery? This, you know, surgery can achieve different things. Um, sometimes we use surgery for diagnostic purposes. For example, if a nodule is um, too small to be biopsied or in a location that cannot be biopsied or if a needle biopsy, for example, is not diagnostic. In scenarios where a patient maybe has just a single lesion, we might use surgery as a role, uh, as a way to get both a diagnosis and potentially be a therapy if it does end up being um, a tumor. Um, of course, we use surgery for curative intent um, for patients who have multiple metastases that are proven and can all be resected. And sometimes uh, this is sort of an emerging role for surgery. Sometimes uh, surgery is used to get more tissue to even guide potential other non-surgical therapies. In terms of how we evaluate um, uh, lung metastases, the CT of the chest is an amazing study. Um, it works really well, even without contrast, to show tiny things in, in the lungs. Um, the technology has really improved so that, that high resolution CT scan, CT scans can show you even one millimeter lesions. Um, the most typical lung metastases have this characteristic look where they're in the periphery of the lung tissue. Periphery meaning the outer third of the lung tissue, sort of where I'm tracing like that. Um, and tend to have this really spherical, well-circumscribed shape. So over here, you can see sort of uh, in the upper right corner, uh, this lung metastasis that I, uh, metastasis that I circled is sort of like a gumball shape and that's sort of like the characteristic look. Here I, I circled another one and this also has that gumball shape but is really tiny. Um, uh, this was one that actually I found with uh, in a VAT surgery. So the key thing is that these tiny lesions can still be um, identified if they're really at the periphery, like right under the pleura, which is the lining of the lung. But let's say if you moved this kind of lesion somewhere two centimeters deeper, um, that would probably be something that couldn't be found even with an open surgery. Um, I also want to point out that even though this is sort of a characteristic look for a lung metastasis, um, totally normal lung nodules could look like this too. That the majority of us, if we got uh, CT scans, may have other similar things like, like this. And we really only pay attention to it in these scenarios if you've had a history um, that puts you at risk for having lung metastases. They don't all look like that. Um, sometimes lung nodules can be calcified. Um, I like this picture as an example because not only can the lung nodules be calcified, especially in osteosarcoma, but they might not always show up in the uh, lung tissue itself. Sometimes they can show up in the mediastinum. Sometimes they can show up in lymph node stations in the mediastinum. Um, this is an example of a calcified uh, nodule that was in the mediastinum and not in the lung tissue itself. Um, and it's important for doctors to know about that because um, other things can have this appearance. So something called granulomatous disease, where lymph nodes can become really calcified, um, can look like calcified nodules in the lung tissue or in the lymph nodes. And in the context of someone who has an osteosarcoma, you never want to just assume that it's one or the other. Other sort of uncharacteristic um, appearances for lung metastases 
that do still happen. Um, some, no some nodules can have what we call cavitation. And here's a zoomed in look of this tiny one here that has a tiny little black spot in the middle. They can become empty in the middle. We can call that cavitation. And sometimes they're not perfect, perfectly round or gumball shaped or well circumscribed. Sometimes um, lung metastases can still have irregular borders or what we call a ground glass halo, this sort of fuzzy grayish look around the lung nodule. Moving on to what are the kinds of surgical resections that we can do for lung metastases. Um, wedge resection means literally just getting the lung nodule and carving out the tissue right around the lung nodule. So this here is an example here is an example of you know picking up a, a part of this lung tissue and then using these staplers to just transect the lung tissue right around where the nodule is. Um, that is a nice way to remove a nodule without having to sacrifice a lot of the surrounding lung tissue. It really is only an option for lesions though that are in the periphery of the lung tissue because as you can imagine, the deeper you go, the less able you are to save the surrounding lung tissue with the wedge resection. Sometimes for lesions that are not in the periphery, so this is an example of a nodule here um, that you can see is, is away from the edge of the lung tissue here. It's actually up against an airway here. And so for, we call this a uh, central location. So for lung nodules that are more central, you might not be able to do a wedge resection. For example, if you were to try to just, oops, uh oh, if you were to try to just cut with the stapler right around there, you would be impeding this airway that is supposed to continue to supply air to the rest of this lung tissue. Um, so for these cases, we will do what we call an anatomic resection. So instead of just doing a random wedge resection of the tissue around that, we actually remove the segment that that, that airway uh, supplies. So we remove the entire tumor with the surrounding um, lung tissue. Sometimes that can just be a segment of the, of the lung, but sometimes that could be the entire lobe of the lung. In some cases, that could be the entire lung on that entire side. That kind of surgery is called a pneumonectomy. Um, these are some examples of cases that required a pneumonectomy. In this case, uh, there was a single met that was so large and was so stuck on both the upper and lower lobes that we had to uh, perform a pneumonectomy. Um, so we removed both the upper and lower lobes with the tumor on this side. Um, this was a case where actually there was a metastasis on the uh, diaphragm that ruptured um, and it sort of bled and filled the entire chest on this side. You can see it's pushing the heart all the way into the right chest. Um, and so in this case, because it had sort of um, uh, filled the entire space there, we, we not only performed a pneumonectomy, we performed what's called an extra pleural pneumonectomy. So in addition to removing the entire lung with the tumor, we removed all of the lining the pleura um, on the chest wall, the diaphragm, and the mediastinum to really remove everything that was potentially contaminated by the rupture of the initial tumor. The one last kind of resection that I think plays a really important role um, as, as a, a very important tool in our toolbox for treating osteosarcoma specifically is precision cautery excision. This is where we use one of these really fine tip um, uh, cautery tips. I think you can see it over here. It's almost like a needle point. We can actually use cautery through this needle point to literally just carve out the tumor with a little bit of surrounding normal tissue. And um, this is a great option for tumors like, for example, this one here where it's very deep and where otherwise, because you can't do a wedge resection, you might be committed to a lobectomy or something like that, that with um, the precision cautery, you could potentially cut down on the lung tissue till you got close to the lung nodule and then still only remove the nodule itself with a thin rim to really spare a lot of the normal lung tissue. It also also is especially important in a case where patients might have multiple, multiple lung nodules. So if someone has, for example, 20 lung nodules, you can imagine that if you were able to just carve out each individual tumor, that would even save so much lung tissue as compared to a wedge resection. 
this kind of technique is not possible through a VATS technique. This is really a technique that we only use uh, in an open surgery. So now that we're bringing up sort of VATS and open and things like that, let's talk about the different ways to approach um, the surgeries that you do on the inside. So the surgical approach can be something that's minimally invasive. And we, when we talk about minimally invasive, we're really specifically talking about VATS. Um, you know, you may have heard of also robotic surgery, which is a type of minimally invasive thoracic surgery. But the reason why we don't usually use that um, for these kinds of cases is that the difference between bats is that you can still feel the lung, um, even though you may not have both of your hands in there, you can still have your fingers in there to palpate the lung tissue. With robot surgery, you cannot feel anything. Um, everything is sort of based on the visualization. Um, the robot doesn't give you the feedback that allows you to palpate lung tissue. And so we generally do not consider robot assisted thoracic surgery for these cases. Um, to go in a little bit more detail about bats, we usually use uh, about three incisions, sort of uh, as you see in this picture, one, two, three, one for the camera and two for the uh, working ports where we insert the instruments. It's usually in this anterior port that we can actually insert a finger to palpate uh, the whole lung tissue. I actually, as much as possible, try to use two fingers so we can actually slide the, the lung tissue between both fingers. Um, the benefits of the video approach is that you have sort of a magnified view with the camera. Uh, now all of our equipment is um, high def and you can have actually a, a very magnified view of it, all the plural surfaces. Um, uh, it's associated with a shorter hospital stay, a faster recovery, which you can imagine might be really important if you have to move back on to other treatments like chemotherapy. Um, it's generally associated with less pain, one thing that I think is really important is that it's associated with fewer adhesions. So like we talked about, because you have to always keep in mind that a lot of patients who have pulmonary metastases will potentially require another operation or further treatments in the future, you want to spare as much lung tissue as possible at all times, but you also want to create as few adhesions every time that you go in so that the next time um, the operation can be easier and not have to require going through as much scar tissue. Um, that surgery can be simultaneous or stage, uh, stage as bilateral surgeries. Um, uh, the only you know real downside is that it's uh, it's not possible to do that precision cautery resection that I described earlier through a VATS um, uh, approach. Um, other technical things to know about the VATS approach, um, because we wanna lift up all the lung tissue to that anterior port so you can palpate the whole lung tissue, one of the critical moves um, is to take down what we call the inferior pulmonary ligament. So the lower lobe is actually stuck down here to the posterior mediastinum by this ligament. And if you take down this ligament using a little bit of cautery, it actually allows the entire up lower lobe to be moved up to the upper half of the chest and makes it much um, easier to do a thorough palpation of the lower lobe. So that is always the first move. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that if you find a lung nodule, you don't wanna immediately say, oh, I found it, let's take it out and do your staple wedge resection. Anytime you do your resection, you potentially create other uh, swelling or hematomas and things like that that could obscure your ability to find other nodules. So at the start of the case, you wanna palpate the entire lung and figure out where every single lesion is before you start resecting. What are some techniques to find lung nodules that you can't palpate? Um, and this is uh, something that's sort of developing. Localizing techniques include placing a wire. You can see here, uh, the wire was uh, inserted into, it has like a little hook at the tip of it um, and is inserted prior to the surgery under uh, uh, CT guidance. They put the needle in so that at the time of the surgery, it's essentially pointing towards where the, uh, the nodule is. Um, the downsides of this technique is uh, that it requires another procedure before the surgery, but also that the um, wire can become dislodged. Um, and so that can, that can be misleading. 
Um, other techniques, they can put in fiducial. So instead of having a wire that goes into the chest wall and, and into the lung tissue, they can actually just um, leave um, a little metal piece there so that it becomes potentially easier to palpate. Um, these tend to be really small though and, and still can be uh, not 100% in terms of localizing. Another technique they came up with is to in inject a dye uh, close to the area of the lung nodule to help you visualize it in, at the time of the surgery. Unfortunately, the dye though can spread and go to other places after it's been injected. One of the newest techniques um, that actually there is a trial open currently for osteosarcoma pulmonary meds is to use near infrared imaging. There is an optical kind of contrast that they can inject that targets a receptor that is expressed on cancers, including on osteosarcoma uh, pulmonary metastases that then with a special near infrared uh, uh, video camera, you can potentially identify at the time of the surgery. So that is a developing technique for localization. A little bit more detail about some of the other surgical approaches. You know, what is a thoracotomy? A thoracotomy, uh, which is the open approach, uh, gives you the greatest exposure of the entire lung parenchyma. This bimanual palpation means that you can actually put both hands in to feel the entire lung tissue. Um, you can do it in different ways. Uh, it, they essentially, the window is created between two ribs and the two ribs are spread apart. Whenever I do a thoracotomy, I actually cut a tiny portion of one of the ribs so that when you spread them apart, you don't get uh, random fractures. Because if you think about it, your ribs are rigid and don't naturally want to be spread apart. Um, and I find that that actually gives people less pain. There's also an option when you do a thoracotomy uh, in terms of sparing the, the muscle. It can be partially muscle sparing uh, by sparing the serratus muscle, but transecting the latissimus muscle, or it can be total muscle sparing, uh, sparing both of those muscles. Um, I would not perform these simultaneously. If someone needs surgery on both sides, I would stage that, but you can do bilateral surgeries in a staged manner. The downsides um, are that obviously you would have greater adhesions everywhere where the incision is because the incision is bigger um, and a longer potential hospital stay or a longer uh, recovery. Another approach that has been used for pulmonary metastases in osteosarcoma is the median sternotomy. Um, this is where you actually cut the breastbone uh, down the center, and this gives you simultaneous uh, exposure of both of the lungs and allows you to do bimanual palpation with both of your hands. Um, the Weak spots sort of of this approach though, is that you have uh, not the best exposure of the bottom of the left lower lobe. So it doesn't give you the best exposure for both sides. Um, and it is associated with a longer recovery. Um, the, the wound generally heals well, but if you do end up having a, a uh, infectious complication or something like that, it actually is much more serious than potentially infectious complications from other kinds of incisions. Um, it can be difficult if you require a second median sternotomy. Um, one last approach that we haven't talked about yet is the clamshell incision. And this is, um, again, gives you simultaneous uh, exposure to both sides of the lung tissue. Um, it, it requires essentially doing thoracotomies on both sides and connecting it in the middle with uh, a cut across the best breastbone that is horizontal. Um, this gives you the best exposure of both sides of the lung. Um, but the downside is that um, it te you, te you have a higher chance of having uh, healing problems with this. If, when you uh, create that that horizontal or transverse cut across the breastbone, you have to take both of the feeding um, arteries uh, on both sides, internal mammaries, and so it tends not to heal as well as even if you did the vertical incision down the breastbone. In terms of the controversy between which is better, BATS versus open, um, for doing pulmonary metastasectomy. I thought this was a very interesting study. They did, um, they got, got uh, enrolled some patients to have one surgical team do a VATS uh, 
uh, metastasectomy. And then in the same setting in the, with the same anesthesia, a second surgical team would then come in and then do a thoracotomy um, to see if there was any difference if, by adding a thoracotomy to a VATS uh, resection. So uh, for 55 nodules on a number of patients that were identified pre-op on a CT scan, um, they said that with the VATS approach, they were able to identify 51 of those nodules. Um, 45 of them were malignant, six of them ended up being benign. Uh, and when those same patients underwent thoracotomy, um, they discovered 29 additional uh, lung nodules that were not found at the time of the VATS surgery. Uh, but what's really important to notice is that 22 of those 29 nodules were not cancers. So those were just you know, benign lung nodules, although seven of them uh, did turn out to be additional metastases. So what is, what is the, the, the main question that is left here, though, is that even if thoracotomy can identify additional lung nodules, what is the relevance of those additional re resections? So some of the things that you would have to ask yourself is that um, for uh, the additional nodules that were not identified on a chest CT or VATS, does the resection of those low nodules impact survival, for example? Does it even impact the need for future operations? For example, in that initial study, retrospective study that we talked about, where um, all those patients underwent thoracotomies, more than half of them still required further surgeries. Um, other important questions on the other side, does all those additional resections impact lung function and the quality of life. Those are not things that are known. Um, and, and does the fact that a lot of additional resections were performed impact the ability to um, uh, provide care after that one procedure? So, for example, you know, anytime you do a resection, including resections for benign nodules, you form uh, scar tissue. And can the scar tissue perhaps make it more difficult to do uh, surveillance um, by, by CT scan? afterwards, or does it make it harder to locate nodules if we do end up requiring another operation? So, you know, it, it's, it's good information to know that uh, in, in some cases, if you do a thoracotomy, you find additional nodules, but that still is not, does not make it clear whether or not that is a benefit. It would be great if we could predict uh, which patients um, uh, without knowing that information, it'd be great to predict which patients, though, if not all patients had additional uh, lung nodules detected on thoracotomy, which ones, um, which ones maybe had the best chance of not, not having missed lung nodules. Uh, and this was a really interesting study where they uh, looked at a bunch of patients who had a CT scan pre-op um, and then thoracotomies and compared well, the number of lesions that were found on CT scan before the surgery, does that, does that predict how many you would find additionally with the thoracotomy? And they found that at least for patients who had a single metastasis on the preoperative CT scan, um, the number of times with the thoracotomy that they were found to have additional metastases, even with the thoracotomy, um, was around 5% or, or around 7%. Um, but the times that they found additional metastases um, when there was more than one target on the preoperative imaging uh, increased significantly to 27%. Um, so it could be that if you have uh, fewer, uh, a, for example, a single lung nodule on your preoperative study, your chances of having um, an equivalent surgery with VATS may be, for example, you know, 95%. Those are things that we don't know, but this, I thought this was an interesting study. Um, we talked at the beginning about how difficult it is to do randomized controlled trials to prove, you know, the overall benefit of metastasectomy, but um, is it possible to do randomized controlled trials to prove other things having to do with pulmonary metastases? Um, Dr. Dosky is a pediatric surgeon at uh, UT San Antonio who has spent uh, dedicated really years uh, to try to put together a randomized controlled trial to look at patients who are likely to have good benefit with, um, with, with fewer metastases um, being randomized to open versus fat surgery. This is a randomized controlled trial that is probably going to be opened this summer. Um, and I think Dr. Dosky is potentially going to be a, a future osteobite speaker to describe that trial. So, you know, if you put together all of this information, um, in the end, 
uh, the approach and the surgery that you do is essentially personalized to the scenario, to the patient and the patient's tumor situation. Um, so if you think about it, some of the things we've talked about, the location of the nodule, so if it's peripheral or central, really makes a big deal in terms of like the surgical approach and maybe the surgical resection even. Um, the number of nodules, whether or not it's completely resectable, how, how you can be the most parenchyma sparing it, uh, based on the number of nodules um, and, and whether or not the number of nodules should determine if you would consider a BATS approach versus open. Uh, the size of the nodules might be important. So um, really tiny nodules or deeper nodules might be better uh, with open surgery, for example, versus bats. Um, if there are bilateral nodules, then you know, some of the things that you would consider is if do you want to do a staged approach with thoracotomies or do you want to try um, a simultaneous approach through um, either median sternotomy or clamshell. Um, you want to always take into consideration if the patient has had previous operations because you don't want to be able to anticipate what the situation is going to be with adhesions. Um, and you also, again, always want to be sparing uh, the lung parenchyma as much as you can. And that includes, uh, especially in cases with deep nodules or multiple nodules, potentially using the open approach so that you can use precision cautery. Of course, you want to consider other medical issues um, and then timing with chemotherapy. I want to mention some of the other local treatments. So, you know, other local treatments that we have, uh, we are starting to gather some initial data about um, uh, for lung metastases is use of radiation. So specifically SBRT, which is a uh, very focused um, high dose of radiation uh, that, that we've used with a lot of success for some lung nodules, uh, lung metastases, and also uh, this new concept of ablation, where you can actually put a needle, direct a needle uh, under the CT scan into a lung nodule, and then either burn it or freeze it in place. Um, both of these approaches have uh, really obvious pros and cons, you know, with the um, uh, radiation, the, it does require coming in every day for a certain number of days, but um, it's truly completely non-invasive. So, for example, so for someone on uh, a blood thinner or something like that who is higher risk for bleeding, um, then that might be a really great option. Uh, for ablation, one of the pros about ablation, it, it happens over the course of one day. You come in, you have the procedure, and there's no uh, no recovery practically. You just go home the same day, actually. Um, and the other nice thing about ablation is that it's really repeatable. You know, as, whereas with surgery and and radiation too, you can't always repeat the same uh, procedure in the same area. Ablation. Uh, one of the pros is that that if you've had an ablation in one area, you can still uh, be a candidate for ablation in a, in a nearby area. In the end, all of our approaches have some you know, major strengths, but also some major weaknesses. And we have had many cases where uh, we've taken a multimodality therapeutic approach. So multimodality, not just in terms of combining a systemic therapy and, and a local therapy, but even combining different local therapies. Um, so for example, that, you know, the the major benefit of surgery is that you can uh, take care of so many nodules at one time, and, and but with, for example, uh, recurrences that are near staple lines or in patients who have already had lobectomies or larger lung resections and can't spare any more um, uh, lung tissue or have had multiple redo surgeries that some of these other techniques like SPRT and ablation uh, can allow the patient to go on to other treatments with almost no break um, um, and, and with a lot Lot less morbidity potentially. So in summary, um, appropriate patient selection is critical for pulmonary metastasectomy. Uh, you have to have control of the primary tumor. Uh, you have to make sure that there's no extra thoracic disease. You have to make sure the patient couldn't tolerate the surgery and that as much as you believe is possible that all lesions can be completely resected. Uh, you also want to, at all times, be mindful of the recurrence rate. So that means that at all times you're trying to spare as much lung tissue as possible and you're trying to minimize adhesions as much as possible. Um, controversies, for example, like fats versus open, really need further studies. Um, uh, in the meantime, we try to use uh, the data that we have about who, do, who, do, who would do better with one approach versus the other.
Um, and then uh, what I think is really critical is multidisciplinary collaboration, um, not just for the therapy. Uh, it's critical for the therapy to time things so that uh, you don't interfere with systemic therapies or to also be strategic in terms of other combining other local therapies, uh, but also in terms of research. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, MIB is an example of, of really promoting uh, both of these things. Um, thank you for that really comprehensive talk. Um, I'm going to just turn over to for questions because we have about uh, 18 minutes and about 20 questions. <laughs> so Charlotte, go ahead. Um, I have two questions. The first one, do you feel that osteosarcoma lung mets can metastasize themselves? So I think no one could answer that question 100%, you know, and so we don't know if that is the case um, or if they exist there already. Um, and so I think that is, it doesn't necessarily change, um, uh, it doesn't necessarily change, you know, our, our strategy, which is to always, you know, spare lung tissue as much as possible. I think it does potentially affect uh, the timing of your surgery, you know, so uh, if you believe that metastases can arise from other metastases, then that might put more pressure in terms of uh, rushing into a surgery or something like that. But at the same time, I think in any case, in, in any sort of theory of, of how metastases happen, the worst case it would be to go in and do a major surgery, but just to have, you know, additional lung nodules appear as soon as you're, you're healed, as, as essentially, you know, and so there are are times where, for example, if someone has a, a single metastasis or, or a limited number of metastases, then um, for that possibility, we might go directly to a surgery. But in a case where there are many metastases or um, uh, rapidly developing metastases, those are scenarios where we might prefer to hold off from rushing into a surgery to make sure that we are understanding like the timeline of their development. Um, uh, for example, to get systemic therapy first before considering a surgery. And then also, um, what are the benefits of the watch and wait philosophy with a nodule that is like three or four milliliters? milliliters? Yes. So I think the main uh, reason to, to uh, watch and wait is because we when we have these like amazing CT scans that can pick up things that are even like a millimeter, um, of course, a lot of those are not going to be metastases. At the same time, they're too small to biopsy and to, to really know what they are. And so this is, uh, it, it's like the amazing thing about having such great imaging that you can pick up these teeny tiny things, but also the problem, which is that you know it, you know it's there, but you don't know what it is. Um, so it would be amazing if at some point we had some way to identify what they were, uh, you know, once you saw them. But the fact that the far majority of the lung nodules, even at the time of these resections where they were finding additional nodules were not related to cancer even, um, it is why we watch and wait. If something was benign, technically it can still grow with time, but that would give you enough concern to want to pursue some sort of intervention. Great, thank you. I have one question. Um, so can lung metastases for osteosarcoma ever be truly eliminated slash cured if resection is not possible? For example, like if they're too many, too small, you know, too deep, et cetera. Um, and second sentence is I understand that radiation is not possible because of the lungs position near the heart and other organs. Um, obviously radiation is an option, but. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, just like with surgery, you have to look at the situation to, to decide if it's appropriate or not. That happens too with radiation oncologists when they consider whether or not someone is a candidate or a lesion even is a candidate for SVRT. Um, so, so it sort of depends on the situation. Um, and then uh, I, what was the first question again? Uh, can lung metastases for osteosarcoma ever be uh, truly eliminated or cured right. if infection is not possible? Well, you know, I think it's a little bit hard to answer because there are cases where, for example, we're watching lung nodules that after systemic treatment stop growing. And for example, in that scenario, uh, does that mean that maybe it wasn't a metastasis or does that mean that it was metastasis that was treated? And there are times too where we resect nodules um, that are still apparent on imaging, but on um, final pathology may not contain any viable cells. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it sort of probably also depends on the situation. 
Um, if a patient has multiple lung metastasis and not all of them are able to be surgically resected, is it is there a benefit to resecting what can be and just going on with that, or is there is it better to just not do surgery? So in general, we don't. If you can't get a local treatment to every lesion, then we do not believe that there is a benefit to just resecting some lesions. Because you, if, if you think about it, whenever you do that, you are essentially making it impossible to be on any other treatment. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, when you have surgery, you are you know, sort of potentially aggravating the other ones. But for example, in our scenarios where we use multimodality treatments, it could be that all of them are great surgical, all of the lesions except for one or two are great candidates for surgery. And we might do surgery on, on all of those, knowing that we still have a plan for either SVRT or radiation to give treatment to the remaining two. So I think you can expand the number of cases where you can can provide maybe not a surgical treatment to every lesion, but a local treatment. Um, but I still do think it's really Im important when you embark on attempts at local therapy that you're, you have a plan for all of the lesions. Thank you. Um, another question is, is that if, is there any way to know which institutions have which therapies and how to look for which therapy is best? Well, in general, I mean, for all of, uh, for rare diseases in general, you want to go to a place where it's multidisciplinary and they have expertise, you know, and, and that's, for example, that's how we, um, uh, how, how we work together. And at UCLA, we have a multidisciplinary group and that's how we actually involve even people who um, are, we know are outside of the expertise to become part of our, our expert group uh, because of the techniques that they offer. So, you know, for example, um, um, even though we have great uh, people who do ablation um, at, at our institution, you know, we generally work with a specific person who is developing expertise, um, who comes to all of our multidisciplinary, you know, meetings to discuss the patients. Um, same with our, you know, we have multiple radiation oncologists who offer SBRT, but in general, our patients work with uh, the ones who are specializing in doing research and then coming to the tumor boards. Same with the surgeons and, and medical oncologists. So I think going to an institution that has expertise will be able to direct you to the right people at your own institution. And if there isn't that, that thing av available at that institution, um, I'm sure they'd be able to, to refer you to other places. Um, you know, we do that too for, for techniques that we don't have available here. You know, we, it's, it's sort of like, you know, I, how I think of myself as like a doctor, you know, not just a surgeon that I, when I evaluate a patient, I'm not just thinking about like, what would be the best surgery for you, but what is the best treatment for you, you know? And so that really opens up to uh, potentially helping, helping you guys find uh, the best resources. So get to a sarcoma center. <laughs> right. A really important thing. And at MIB, we give out no medical advice. The one piece of advice we do give out is get to a sarcoma center, if only to have them ride shotgun on your treatment, which they are all willing and able and capable of doing. I so, mean, even with my own patients, I, you know, especially for rare diseases, you know, second opinions even are so important, you know, and multiple opinions. And um, so, so definitely you wanna, you want to, it's just like incredible how there's like MIB and all these, you know, ways to get such an, an valuable information now. Um, so you definitely want to take advantage. Yeah, we do have a link to SARC. Uh, if you go on their website directly, it's SARC trials, S-A-R-C trials dot org, I think. Um, but you can always go on mibagents.org and there's a link to um, SARC trials. They have a list, a really easy, easily searchable list for um, sarcoma centers. Charlotte? Um, do you think that many small nodules end up being accentuated vessels or a peripheral pulmonary vein? Oh, so um, most of the time you can tell, and I like to show patients when they come to my clinic, how you can scroll up and down and really be able to differentiate. So if you've looked at a lot of CT scans, you almost always can tell if something is a lung nodule versus a vessel, but it can be very tricky if you haven't sort of been doing it like all the time um, uh, to, 
to, to you know, review a CT scan by scrolling up and down and up and down. I mean, and anytime I look at one CT scan, it, it actually takes a long time because I, I do, you know, everyone has their own technique, but I do one lobe at a time. So I scroll up and down a billion times looking at one lobe. Then I scroll up and down a billion times just focusing on another lobe and another one um, because you can't look at the whole thing at once. And, and every nodule, it can't be really tricky. Some of them that are right next to blood vessels can be a little bit hard to differentiate, but there are ways if you're really um, used to used to scrolling uh, on the CT scan like that and sort of have it in your mind that I'm a very suspicious person when I look at CT scans I'm I'm suspecting that they're everywhere to make sure that you don't miss any. Can you tell on the camera if a met is osteosarcoma or not and can you tell in general by looking at it? By the um, so no, you can't. So, so some things can be calcified and not non osteosarcoma metastasis even, and some things can look exactly like it, but then turn out to be an infection or inflammation or even just scar. Um, so, so you really can't, um, assume just by how it looks or how it feels even at the time of surgery. Um, uh, like that example of the uh, mediastinal lesion, you know, that was read as like granulomatous disease, but ended up not, um, and, and vice versa, where we've done surgery on patients and, and realized their exactly gumball looking pulmonary nodule ended up being like a coxy uh, fungal infection. There's a question that uh, you suggested that one must have no extra thoracic metastatic disease to qualify for surgery. Um, are metastases in the pleura considered extra thoracic? Um, no, that, so, so that is also con considered to be in the chest. Um, pleural lesions are a little bit different um, in that sometimes, you know, a pleural lesion can represent more diffuse disease, um, but, but that would be considered intrathoracic. And I, and I should really qualify when I say extra thoracic disease, that doesn't necessarily mean it automatically rules you out for pulmonary metastasis if you have extra thoracic disease, for example, in the bone or something like that, but it's limited and has uh, can be treated, um, then potentially that would be considered under control, like the primary is under control and you could still potentially be a candidate for a lung metastasectomy. Do you believe there is a max number of thoracotomies or other lung surgeries that patients should have or not? have, they should get more? Um, I mean, I think it should really depend on how successful you think that thoracotomy is going to be. Um, you know, I, there is no inherent number or limit. Um, but every single time that you do one, you potentially are uh, creating morbidity, you know, for, from the lung resection and sort of the changes to the chest wall. Um, so it has to be essentially worthwhile. And every time that you do um, multiple resections through a thoracotomy, for example, it, it does become more difficult to um, uh, identify lung nodules potentially in the future at the time of future surgeries, because then you can imagine you start palpating also scar, old staples, and things that are not actually nodules. Um, so I think, I think sort of the yield with each additional one might go down. And so you have to sort of make a, a decision um, based on the individual situation. Is there any way to minimize scar tissue from surgery? That's a great question. You know, um, so right now our main strategy for minimizing uh, scar tissue is, for example, using like a VATS approach compared to like a thoracotomy approach. I mean, the less you touch, essentially, the less scar tissue that you have. Um, you, you want to have scar tissue in general. I mean, that's part of the healing process. Um, but, but right now our main strategy is by doing less surgery. So not resecting um, uh, any lung tissue that you don't have to resect, um, not dissecting in areas that you don't need to dissect, um, and not creating uh, big incisions if you don't need to. If you saw a lung nodule in the lung area, but not in the lung tissue, would you still resect it surgically, or would you consider another type of uh, treatment or surgery? Um, so for example, the um, sometimes we see changes in um, uh, what are generally known as lymph node stations or mediastinal lesions, and I do resect those sometimes. Um, uh, 
most of the time those are in the context of other lung nodules that make you suspicious that those, those could be metastases as well. Um, but if I were to do a pulmonary metastasectomy and knew that there were other uh, potential lesions that were in the mediastinum, I would resect those too, as long as they were uh, technically resectable. Let me know if I'm saying stuff that doesn't make sound <laughs> like makes sense to you guys. <laughs> Oh, you're good. <laughs> Thank you. There's there's a question if um, surgery can potentially activate metastasis. Yeah, we don't know that, but that's such a, a good question, you know, because when you do a surgery, you go through a period of time where you're releasing a lot of growth hormones and, you know, because you're going undergoing this like healing process, there's a lot of inflammation. Um, and some of those things are things, uh, you know, you might be uh, considered immune suppressed during that period of time, you know, it's like essentially a stressful experience. And so some of those things are associated with, um, you know, potentially promoting like a, a tumor environment, but um, I don't, I don't know that that's proven. Um, but but I think that's a great question and, and, and really deserves more research. Do you think because the CT scan are so good today, it is okay to do VATS with like three nodules and maybe one that's harder to get? Well, so um, I think that's why uh, Dr. Dosky's uh, upcoming randomized control trial will be really important to see whether or not there are specific groups of patients um, who might benefit from VATS uh, approach versus thoracotomy. And so his study is looking specifically at patients who only have four or fewer metastases. He's, he's only enrolling patients who have a limited number of metastases on each side, um, specifically, I think, to answer that question. That was like, you're going to take a nap after this. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Before we leave too, um, there are some things that you need to know from MIB agents this month. Um, the first is that our osteosarcoma resource packets are ready. Um, these packets contain the book, the osteosarcoma um, from our families to yours uh, resource book. Um, resources from our partners at Osteosarcoma Institute, the Osteosarcoma Project, and the Amputee Coalition. Um, these are available to osteosarcoma families and institutions who serve osteosarcoma patients. A well-informed patient, a well-informed family is really your best bet at, at getting through this thing. Um, please go to our website and um, you'll, you'll find osteosarcoma resources and we'll, we'll send one out to you. Or if you're an institution, we'll send a bunch out to you. Uh, coming up next week is Sumit Gupta, MD, PhD, who will be speaking on long-term mental health outcomes in adolescents and young adults with cancer. So important. Seriously, everybody needs to be here next week. <laughs> like that's going to be such a good one. And uh, it's our first time talking to Dr. Gupta. So really excited about that. Um, again, thanks for joining us today on this very sunny day. Um, thank you, Dr. Yanagawa, for sharing so much time with us, your expertise, and most of all, your care for osteosarcoma patients and families. Um, really valuable. And we're so grateful. Um, thanks also to our panelists, Charlotte, Mia, Agent V, and Amy. Um, thank you all for being here with us today, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can view our library of this and all Osteobytes topics and rockstar speakers. You can also listen to Osteobytes via podcast wherever you get your podcast.